What was it like growing up in Scientology? It was a little unusual, I would say. <laughs> yeah, I bet. I bet. Tell us a little bit about, uh, I mean, so you were just like a baby. You were a baby Scientologist. So I was four years old when my mom got introduced to Scientology. So it was my mom raising me and my twin brother. And she had grown up in Iowa, gone to school in Iowa, everything like that. And, um, and then when she was having us, like she and my father were never married. That's why I have the two last names, Smith Levin. So my mom's name is Smith. My dad's name is Levin. And they were never married. Um, and so uh, by the time I was born, so my mom raised us as a single mother until she got remarried later on, okay? So she moved from Iowa out to the East Coast, out to the uh, New Jersey, Philadelphia, Boston, Massachusetts area, the Northeast. And somehow she met a friend named Cheryl Scordato who got her introduced to Scientology. And so my earliest memories, some of my earliest memories are of being in a Scientology organization in downtown Philadelphia in a nursery that they had there for kids of the staff members and kids of the public. And because my mom, as soon as she got introduced to Scientology, she pretty much jumped right away and joined staff to work for them. She wasn't one of these people who just paid them a bunch of money to do Scientology. She was one of the staff members. So, you know, when you're four, you don't really know anything. So it's not like you can pick up a Scientology book and start reading L. Ron Hubbard. <laughs> so for these early years, Scientology for me was just something my mom did. And it was just where we went to go play with the other kids. Wow. And so your and your dad where where was he at this stage? So, uh, Minnesota. Like my dad grew up in like Washington, I think like uh, uh Washington state, and I think my mom met him. He was a musician and um so like I was actually born in Montana, but my mom was living in Iowa. I think my dad was living in Minnesota. And then I was just born, I think my mom was like on vacation or whatever and ha ha gave birth. <laughs> so I'm born in Montana. I was born in Montana, but neither of my parents were living in Montana uh, to the best of my knowledge at that time. <laughs> There's a lot of moving around here. And that's something that I found really common with Scientology itself. Of course, L. Ron Hubbard was moving around in this boat. I mean, we're talking years before, I think. Um, and, and just every Scientologist I've spoken to seems to have moved from place to place. Do you think that was something somehow related to your mom's decision to join Scientology? Was she, she searching for something? Oh, yeah. I'd say there's probably some overlap there as far as always looking for something new, better, or the answers or something like that. Because um, it's true. Scientologists tend to be a little nomadic. <laughs> and um, so, and, and even when I say, like people ask me, where did you grow up? Well, it's hard to answer that question. I mean, uh, I say Philly, but when I think about it, like, I was only in the suburbs of Philly in Malvern, Pennsylvania from fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, but those were formative years. And it's like, well, it feels like that's where I grew up. Before that, it would have been South Jersey and Haddonfield, New Jersey, but that was like kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade. So I just say Philly because it's like, you know, because then I spent a lot of years working in downtown Philadelphia for Scientology. So I just go, I grew up in Philly, but I didn't really grow up in Philly. It is sort of very nomadic, as you say. And then, so as a young person, as a young child, of course, were you at like a school that like, would it be a normal school? So I did go to normal public school from kindergarten through sixth grade. So these, these younger years of my memories, this, this, it was just in a nursery, which is just a room in a Scientology org where they stuck the kids. And that was just to keep the kids from wreaking havoc, you know, in, in other places of the org. So it wasn't a school. There was nothing educational about the nursery at the Scientology org. It was really just stick the kids there so they can't bother anyone else and make, and make noise. And we did, we did wreak havoc anyway. Um, <laughs> yeah, <I bet. laughs> right in downtown Philly, we'd escape from the org and just run around downtown, you know? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, that would be during the day if it was like the weekend or whatever, but it would also be late at night. You know, we'd be in the nursery at the org until 10 o'clock at night because that's, those were the hours of the org. And my mom was a staff member at the org. So we'd fall asleep at the org most nights. Um, uh, yeah, it's, it's a little weird thinking of having children out at your place of work until 10 o'clock at night. And that doesn't mean 10 o'clock at night is when you left the org. That's just when um, the course room officially wrapped up. That's just when people started winding down. You know, we might not leave the org until 11 o'clock.
for some people, I mean, most people listening now are probably very familiar with Scientology, but for those who are hearing about this for the first time, what, what is the org? Because this was initially the Sea Org a boat, right? Oh, right. So the org, well, so um, Scientology calls its churches of Scientology orgs. So org just stands for organization. And, and, and I guess not to be confused with the Sea Org. So the Sea Org is the Sea Organization. And yeah, that's another... That's another thing. So the C organization composes like Scientology management. Uh, uh, the C organization, you would call it a religious order or a religious fellowship, at least the, the law would consider it that. Uh, the, okay, the C organization are the Scientologists who have pledged um, to work for Scientology for the rest of their lives, and they sign the one billion year contracts. So those are C org members. So that's considered the most dedicated core of Scientology staff. Um, and so what I'm talking about is completely separate from that. The, the Philadelphia org is not a C org org. So it's not an org staffed by C org members. Um, it's staffed by uh, people who are on two and a half year contracts or five year contracts. And then once you finish that contract, you're, 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 cons you're done. You're fine. You don't owe Scientology any money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> what kind of things was your mom doing then day to day into the evening while you were um, at this sort of crash, I suppose? I think it was two different things. At, at one point, she was uh, running the academy, which is where all the, the Scientology courses are delivered. It's where Scientology auditors are trained. And then at a later point in time, she had a job of like f um, helping to correct the uh, Scientology auditors for any mistakes that they make in an auditing session. Uh, both of those jobs require, uh, in, in Scientology world, a significant amount of training. Um, and even for some of those periods, she went, uh, she left uh, the family, uh, in Jersey to go down to Clearwater, Florida full time for either six months or 12 months. It's hard to remember. Um, and so even at that young age, you know, my mom was gone for long periods of time just to do training on how to do her Scientology job in Philadelphia. Did you feel love from your mom in, in, in a sort of, uh, well, yeah. Did you feel love? Yeah. Yeah. This is probably in contrast to a lot of other stories that I hear from people who are raised in Scientology. I, my mom never, particularly at that younger age, uh, never treated us like we were just cogs in the machine or that we were only there to hopefully serve Scientology or that our value was somehow tied to what we did in Scientology. That was never, that was never an issue. Now, we were already only 12 years old when we ourselves did join staff. But even then, she was always um, probably... Uh, a force for more protecting us to the degree that she could from just being a cog in the machine and actually caring for our well-being. So, but I hear a much different story from other people who grew up in Scientology. Uh, even people who grew up in Scientology with parents that were just public as opposed to staff members. Like I've heard stories of people who grew up in Scientology, their parents were just public and their parents still treated them like the only reason they were there as, as beings was to serve Scientology. We never particularly had that put up, pushed upon us. Andrew Gold? Yeah? You've been saying bad stuff about us on the internet. Ah, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses? No. No. Nixium? Not that one. Scientology. How did you find me? You should have used a VPN, mate. Has this ever happened to you? Well, Probably not exactly, but there are still plenty of reasons you need Atlas VPN, the best VPN deal on the market at just $1.70 a month and a 30-day money-back guarantee. You can unlock your favorite content from all over the world. You can keep your Google searches private and you can protect unlimited devices. I'm so rubbish with technology. Me too, mate, but it's easy. You just open up Atlas VPN and choose which country you want to go to. Huh, how about Mexico? Only this time of the year, escape the cold. So the internet really thinks we're in Mexico? Yep, and you can go anywhere in the world. Yeah, and you can watch TV shows only available in that country. It really is pretty easy. Have a private Christmas and a safe new year with Atlas VPN Premium. You can have it for just $1.70 per month, plus six months for free with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Click the link in the video description below and grab this Christmas deal right now. It must, have, it must screw people up. I remember Mike Rinder talking about it just with his own child who unfortunately died um, I th as a baby, I think. Uh, and just, 
he was obviously sad, but he also had this feeling of like, okay, well, it's just this sort of body thetan uh, that can go into another body and it's not like a real thing. I guess the religion was like that strong in him at that at that point. So it is really sad. Well, I would say, I mean, we had a bit of an unstable childhood in general, probably just due to, you know, personal factors in my mom's life. But I would say not specifically due to Scientology, you know. Like it's not easy being a, a kid that young and and having like a revolving door of boyfriends or husbands, you know. Like, um, it, I just remember it, it 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 had an impact on me. I mean, there's an instability to it. Um, you know, my mom did remarry at one point um, and have a I have a half brother from that marriage. Um, but and after that, she even remarried again and, and then again. And then, um, and then in between the marriages, there were boyfriends. And that's not even a, a criticism on someone's personal life. I'm just talking about from my perspective as a young person, there was a lot of instability. And you combine that, what I just described, also with moving from place to place relatively frequently. Um, that, yeah, I, I don't necessarily look on back on my childhood very fondly. Um, and that might just be because, you know, memory can also be very selective. Um, but it wasn't due specifically to being treated like, um, like I was just there to be a cog in the wheel. And, and it wasn't due to feeling a lack of love for my mom either. That wasn't an issue. I wonder then if that also crosses over if we talk about your your mom uh, in that sort of pursuit of something, a pursuit of recognition or whatever it might be, and you find it in other boyfriends and things like that. What What was your mother like is she still with us oh yeah yeah yeah. i mean i'm only 42 she's 62 <laughs> yeah well i know I, i'm not suggesting you're old but you never you never know when people no you know. that's true that's true that's true yeah i don't know she's around <laughs> and she actually still more believes in scientology i mean she was declared uh, she's not in scientology anymore but she still believes in l ron hubbard and scientology and uh you know that it works and that um, auditing you know solves problems and whatever and and it's become a source of friction not that i give her friction for it she actually gives me friction for thinking it's all trash and i'm like what are you gonna do with that i don't give you <laughs> doing it don't give me shit for shitting on it you know yeah yeah do you have a, do you have a good relationship though otherwise now I would say it's strained for sure. That's quite standard. That happens with parents. <laughs> that happens with parents and children, or well, sometimes anyway. So, so that was going on with your childhood, and and they do say that instability is is one of the hardest things in childhood. It's like you know, growing up rich or poor, religious or not, as one thing, but the instability is difficult. Are there ways in which that affects who you are today? That sort of hang, hang ups and hangovers. <laughs> Um, I think any negative hangups or hangovers that I have now are more from uh, ha uh, everything that happened after I started working for Scientology when I was 12 and not so much things that happened before that, actually. Okay, well, let's get into that then. So what, <laughs> what was the next stage? Because working when you're 12, unless you're Macaulay Culkin in um, Home Alone or something, apart from actors and models, that's sort of unheard of. So, I mean, that, how do they get around that? I mean, they get around it because nobody knows it's happening, really. Um uh, you know, Scientology staff members are considered religious volunteers. They're not actually considered, um, in the eyes of the law, employees, even though they're on staff contracts, but it's really a contract defining the terms of your volunteer status. Um, believe me, Scientology doesn't consider you a volunteer. They just hide behind that when it comes to the law. Um, so, wait, what was the question? <laughs> Well, no, but just going oh, through it. So, what, were you a were, Yeah, were you excited to start working? I was excited because my mom made us excited. Like this is this is one of the sources of friction, where it really rubs her the wrong way that I would ever describe anything about um, this path that we traveled into becoming Scientology staff members as anything other than our own decision, something we wanted to do, we decided to do, and you go, we're kids. We do what you tell us to do. We try to be as excited about it as possible. You know, that's kind of what kids, you know, even if you make a kid do something they don't want to do, eventually they're going to figure out how to have at least as much fun as possible doing the thing they didn't want to do in the first place. That's how kids work. Um, and, and so like even the fact that I'm going to be like, we didn't want to do it. And she'd be like, well, it was your decision. It's like, we didn't even... How can you make a decision about something you don't even know what it is? Like you don't know the decision and, and then you're being guided 
that way by your parents, by your parents. And it's like, uh, so we didn't, we got excited about it because we had to and chose to and were expected to. And it's it's not like we were dragged kicking and screaming through this entire process. We, we eventually uh, were convinced to do it, um, decided we wanted to do it, uh, got good at doing it and succeeded in doing it. But when that when that whole thing starts at the age of 12, you know, uh, the fact that my mom's always sort of even been unwilling to acknowledge that um, you're you're right. That wasn't really something of your own choosing. I pushed you along that way. She she just hangs on to the fact of oh, but you didn't put up that much of a fight. And it's like oh, come on, you know. Like honestly, like like she uh, she does not like the episode that I filmed of Leah Remini Scientology in the aftermath. You know, her response to that was sort of like oh, you must hate me. And I'm like the fuck are you talking about? Like, I can't talk about my own life without you making it about you. How about you understand where I'm coming from and show a little bit of, you know, humility um, and, and perspective that it's not all about you. It's actually about your kids, which, um, yeah, anyway, I don't want to go on a tangent. Yeah. Well, Erin, you'll be delighted to know we've actually got your mum in the studio to, <laughs> to have this conversation. Jerry, Jerry. No, um, I wouldn't usually make that joke about these kinds of things, except I know Erin quite well now. So no, I'm, I mean, I, I mean, look, I'm, I'm, I love the humor. And, and but look, uh, there, there are secret little groups tucked away in corners of the internet for second generation Scientologists. And this is a very common theme where the first generation parents who brought their second generation, um, you know, their kids into it are just um, completely unwilling to acknowledge the effect that bringing kids into something like this and pushing them to do it and expecting them to do it and putting up the guardrails so that they can't really not do it uh, gives them a significantly different experience than the adults who chose to do all this on their own determinism and the unwillingness to, to, to even recognize that there's two different experiences here uh, leads to a lot of tension in a lot of former Scientology families. So it's, it's not unique. It's not unique to me at all. And, and it seems to be pretty damn consistent, you know, pretty damn consistent. I, I can actually, I can imagine that I can, I can see that. Um, so at 12 years old, what kind of work are you and your twin brother doing? So at this point, it's just studying. It's just studying. So we, well, when we joined staff at the Philadelphia Org, it was with a view of going full time to Clearwater, Florida to train as professional Scientology auditors. Um, but you can't go to Florida to do that training until you've already done a bunch of basic training at your own organization. So there was a handful of Scientology courses to the Scientologists watching, you know, staff status one and two, student hat, method one co-audit and, you know, other basic courses. <laughs> um, and, you know, those courses themselves would take not less than six months of part-time study because we weren't, we were studying, um, so remember I said I went to public school until the sixth grade. So for the seventh grade, and at this time my mom had remarried, so I had me, my twin brother, my younger brother, my stepbrother, my stepsister, uh, except my younger brother didn't live with us full time. He lived with his father half, most of the time. So we basically had four kids in the household and two parents, okay? Um, my mom and my stepdad. And so what we did for the seventh grade is we were pulled out of school to do homeschool. And we would do homeschool during the morning and, and the afternoon. And then we would go into the org uh, five nights a week and the weekends. So as a 12-year-old, or maybe at this point, maybe I'd already turned 13, we are going into the Scientology org in downtown Philadelphia to study from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. That's our study schedule. I mean, you're studying until 10 o'clock at night. I have three kids of my own. I couldn't imagine. I'm, I'm telling them to go to bed by 10. <laughs> I mean, we're just we're just getting off of course at 10. We still have to wrap up and you know drive a half hour home and everything like that. And that's pretty much from what I can recall, I think seven days a week, maybe six, maybe six days a week. So just to get just to get that right, that was what so homeschool and then at seven p and after that at seven PM to ten PM, did you say? Correct. Yeah. yeah it's Correct. Sad. And it's one of these things where as a kid I can remember being like, I don't want to be here. I don't want to be doing this, but it's not like we're working in the coal mines. We're just sitting here studying uh, books in a course. Like it's not, it's not exactly heavy labor. 
and event, and, you're, and you're like, I don't understand half of what I'm studying. I mean, this stuff is absurdly. This is adults have ha, adults struggle to understand some of this material. We're twelve, maybe thirteen at this point, and and we have to do it because this is what we have to do in order to go to Clearwater to flag. And again, I'm not trying to. I'm not trying to exaggerate anything. It's not like, oh my, I can think of much worse things. But a lot of things get justified with that explanation. Oh, there's worse things. Well, there's always worse things. <laughs> <laughs> well, in some parts of Scientology, there aren't many worse things in the in the deepest parts, you know, in the hole and things like that. But uh, we can get further into the mechanics of Scientology late, later on. But I mean, some of yeah, really so, so the answer, yeah, so the answer was we're just studying at this point, studying Scientology, yeah. studying Scientology and doing Scientology courses so that we can qualify to go to Clearwater to study more Scientology courses. And, um, and we did okay. You know, we did okay on it. It took us a while, but not not a long time. And then eventually, I was 13 when we finished those courses and were approved to go to Clearwater to study full time, which is what I then did for the next three years straight. What about maths, French, <laughs> biology stuff? Do 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 most people who grow up in Scientology then lack some of that stuff? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, I didn't go to high school. I, I mean, I, like, yeah, I I never. We did homeschool for the seventh grade. We technically speaking were certified as having finished the seventh grade, and that was it. How old's that? Se seventh grade. And so I, um, seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve, twelve years old, thirteen years old, depending on when you started school. I started school a little early, um, so for me it would have been twelve, uh, late okay. twelve, early thirteen. So you don't know what an Oxbow Lake is. What's Oxbow Lake? <laughs> that was like this stupid thing that I always remember from like my geography GCSE, a 16-year-old exam when I was 16 or whatever. Uh, and I always like, it was the one thing that I remembered on the tests was what an Oxbow Lake is. And it was like, it's when a river, this is for everyone's going to be fascinated to know this, has a bend in it. And eventually the bend gets so big that the river just goes over it. So it goes straight. And then, it, then the bit that was the bend gets cut off. And then it's Knoxbow Lake. That's funny. No, the only lakes that I remember is Okeechobee and Titicaca. <laughs> yeah, well, well, those are those those are great names. <laughs> those are the names you learn at twelve, though. But no, that I mean, it's a thing, isn't it? And I spoke to some former Scientologists about it, and they really feel like they were let down, like they didn't get that. And on the one hand, I would say, as somebody who did then go through the typical education, you do forget ninety nine percent of it. So you know, but I'm sure there's stuff that you must you must feel. Do you feel a bit resentful about having missed out on that? Um, the only reason I don't is because I've been quite successful. Um, but like, I wish I'd had an opportunity to study like political science uh, or computer science or um, or history more because I find those things fascinating and it's hard to just casually spend hours and hours and hours learning about that stuff because you're supposed to be able to get an opportunity to do that in school. Um, but you know, it's one of those things like you just mentioned, you forget 99% of the stuff that you've learned. I have not necessarily found that people who have gone through the traditional system and gone to university and all that stuff, I have not personally found that those people are any more prepared or better equipped to succeed in life than I am. So I don't have a ton of regret. I do just wonder, um, yeah, but you've done well without all that. Just imagine what you could have done with some of that. Well, know? well, yeah, and or, or or you might be a bit of an anomaly. There are loads of us. Look, to do what you and I do, it, it is quite different to school and the stuff you learn there. But you must know some people who grew up in Scientology who maybe haven't done as well, who might have benefited from a more stable and traditional educational system. I would say most of them fall into that category. And when I say I've been successful, I don't mean on YouTube. I, I've been successful in business outside of YouTube. Um, and so, uh, and, and sometimes people will ask me, well, did Scientology give you any of the tools that helped you do that? And I sort of go, how the hell would I know? It's the only path that I traveled. Like it can be very hard for me to be able to differentiate between what are the qualities that are sort of innate and I would have taken into life no matter what, or what sort of qualities did perhaps I learn from Scientology. I'm more inclined to think that some of the negative personality traits or aspects are more likely to be what I took from Scientology. But again, who knows? It, it's hard to know, you know? I, I, I do happen to be someone who believes that most of our personality traits and characteristics are genetic. I mean, I do believe that. Um, and so who knows? Who knows? And I forget what the question I was asking was. Oh, oh that, just the education. You know, I am sort of a sponge for knowledge. Like, I do feel like I can probably 
Um, I am one of these people who would greatly benefit from just uh, like, have you ever heard of the Khan Academy? It's basically like a free online academy um, I, um, from K through 12 and even up to higher education. I believe it's free. Um, uh, I, I'm someone who I think tries to soak up knowledge about subjects I'm passionate about, even if it has nothing to do with what I do for a living. I just personally love those things. Whereas, so if I had traveled a more traditional route, I would probably have found a subject that I'm really passionate about and wound up being a professional in that area. Do you know what I mean? Whereas now, um, I just study those subjects just for fun and not, it's not, you know. That's worked out well for you. And I, I think that's something that like I often have to address on this show. We, we deal with people who have been in, you know, quite horrific or atrocious cults sometimes and all those kinds, but there's often grains of truth even within them. And there are often positives. It's just, they're just outweighed by the negatives in general. Um, and I can see how it could help you in business being, you know, the Scientology, that directly looking in people's eyes, that go get them attitude, that, that philosophy of, I, you know, I can change. I've got the power to sort of do do what I want. That instead of just being another cog in a school, yeah. I'm not suggesting anyone join Scientology. By the way, so what what happened? Go on. I'll tell you though. Even even one of the things you hear about Scientology uh, in the most negative way, as far as everything is your fault, no matter what happens to you, everything is your fault. In a business sense, that's a very productive way of thinking about things. Like if if right, it doesn't matter if it's true. It matters if it puts you in a frame of mind of always trying to fix a problem, find a problem, fix a problem, uh, you know, never settle for less than, uh, you know, accomplishing your goal. Um, nothing uh, should be allowed to stop you because anything that stops you, you're the one that's allowing it to stop you. Um, we very quickly get into things that just remind me of uh, Gary Vanderchuk and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What well, also the the fixed mindset? I can't remember versus the growth mindset. I can't remember who that is. Uh, I just want to quickly look it up because people will be saying that's that's, that's not someone... that's not Tim Ferriss, is it? I don't know. It might. Be. I thought it was a a, a female a female philosopher. It might just be something that's known about in philosophy. You know, I don't know the fixed mindset and the, and the growth mindset. And and I don't know. You know, if you're if you're a growth mindset, it might help to be told, hey, everything's your fault, because then you go, okay, what can I do to, to grow? What can I do to be better, be better all the time, even if it's not true, as you say, even if it's not your fault and your responsibility. If you're in a fixed mindset, I think maybe that's not going to be very helpful to you because you can't, unless you can get out of that fixed mindset. Well, I'll tell you, I think what we're talking about here also goes to explain why so many of the people who get into Scientology get in through Scientology's business consulting front groups, because that Scientology message you can fit, you, you are in control of everything. You are, can be a cause over anything. A, a, everything is your fault, and therefore you need to figure out what to do about these things. That resonates with business people who are trying to solve business problems and don't want to be told you can't control this and you can't control that. They want to be told you can control it, and here's one or two or three things that you can do about it. It resonates with business people, small small business people who don't have a business background. And that is how the majority of people get into Scientology is through these business consulting groups. So there's something to be said for that. Absolutely, 100%. I had no idea about that. It makes total sense. And you think of like the multi-level marketing companies, which are very similar. They employ similar tactics and Nixium and all these other cults that, that use this kind of, you can do what you want. Even people, a lot of gurus in the internet age, the Elon Musks and the Jordan Petersons of this world, make your own bed. You know, you, you, you are responsible for you, which is true to an extent, of course. And that's, and that's where it falls apart. So let's go further into your, into, so you're, you're now a, a young teenager. What's it like? Do you have non-Scientology friends? Do you have girlfriends and things? So at this point, once you go to Clearwater, uh, so at this point we're in Clearwater, you are in the bubble. You are living and breathing Scientology 24 seven, um, 24 seven. You're living with Scientologists, you're eating with Scientologists, you're studying with science, not just Scientologists, Scientology staff members. And at this point, not just staff members, but Sea Org members. And, and compared to the earlier years of my life, as I've described them, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in Clearwater for the three years that I was there from the age of 12 to 15. Now, I would never let my own kids do it. But I thrived in that environment at that time with those people. Um, because remember, Scientology does not hold that children are just children. They hold that a child 
like like let's, let's, that a 30 year old man is a 76 year old being in a 30 year old body and a 10 year old boy is a 76 year old being in a 10 year old body that 11 years earlier was probably in an 85 year old body. So they don't actually view children as being unique or special or, or not special, like special good, special bad. Like, like they don't view children as someone that needs to be treated um, carefully or protected or shielded. They're just like, you're just, you just happen to have a small body, but 11 years ago you were an adult. So just snap out of it, stop dramatizing being a small person and just grow up. So, now I said that harshly, but my experience was more like I was being given the freedoms of an adult. I was being treated like an adult. I was being given the responsibilities. I was being treated as an equal is, is the best way. To, I was being treated like I wasn't less than. I wasn't just a tag along. I wasn't just along for the ride. I was an equal participant on the on the playing field. Okay. Well, then what I got to ask then, because I think a lot of people just be wondering this, and I got to use. Uh, ridiculous stupid language because of the youtube algorithm but if adults and children are viewed as the same way does that not lead to uh not romantic but i suppose i can use the word sexual things that shouldn't be happening um it does i never experienced that personally but it very much does because if you're already twisted in that way Scientology gives you the perfect justification why it's okay, why that's totally fine, because Thetans are just Thetans. Children, like, there's you know, it's just a small body, who cares? And so I am finding more and more and more things I never even knew were going on, even in the places where I was. That's why I've started to really expose this kind of stuff on my channel. Well, well, yeah, there is something this week you were you were exposing on your channel. What was that? Well, you don't want me to get too far into it because um, it, <laughs> it'll it's it's not it's not YouTube friendly. But I will tell you, I'll tell you in PG terms that it was a Scientology staff member who was um, very successful at raising money for Scientology's real estate projects, and so he was sent out to all the other orgs in the Western United States to help them raise money. But in the process of doing that, he was meeting um female scientology staff members who were under the age of consent and was abusing many of them in many orgs one staff member who was in his late 20s abusing other staff members who were 15 or under and um this went on for years and instead of scientology doing anything to protect those staff members or protect repeat offenses they just shipped him off to clearwater and he's here now so that's why I've been doing videos about him, um, giving him a starring role in my videos. Um, and Scientology, Scientology, it's like, do they necessarily think that's okay? No, the guy got in trouble for what he did. But that sort of behavior is excused by many by going, what's, it's just bodies, what's the big deal? And they really believe that. They really do believe that. And that is twisted. I guess if anyone wants to hear further details on that and all the horrible things, you know, go to Aaron's Growing Up in Scientology channel where he's been reporting on this week. I do apologize to those listening on the audio uh, streams. It's just, we, it's just the stuff goes out on YouTube as well and they have become more and more sensorial and it's just um, it's just insane. So apologies for us having to, to talk as if we are children or whatever about these subjects, which are, you know, very serious uh, subjects. So so, okay, so at this stage, you're, you're 15, 15 or so, 16. Did you feel special? Did you feel special compared to normies? What do you call normies? 100%. Oh, that Scientology calls them wogs. I have come to learn that in many parts of the world, wog is a racial slur. And you have to think, you have to think that L. Ron Hubbard knew that. Wow. What a yeah. weirdo. Yeah, wog is a racial slur in many parts of the world, particularly about... Um, Asians, even in Britain, wog can be used as a racial slur. I mean, it doesn't have the power as the N-word, it, but it means the same thing. It doesn't have the same punch, if you will. Um, and that is Scientology's word for non-Scientologists. It's used just, it's one of the most common words used. Oh, hey, oh, um, I'll be there at five. I got to finish up at my wog job. That means the job that I work outside of the Oregon, it's for a non-Scientologist. If you work for a Scientologist, it's actually not called a wog job. Right, right. So, so was L. Ron Hubbard, I mean, do we know about him being, but for anyone who doesn't know, this was the creator of Scientology, a science fiction writer from the 
40s and 50s, I suppose. Um, did he come out with a lot of racist stuff? Do we get many people from minorities who are Scientologists? I think L. Ron Hubbard was about as racist as you would expect for the time period, personally. And and I say that I say that because I never took any racial undertones from anything I read or listened to in my time in Scientology. But it could be because I wasn't looking for it, or 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 it would have gone right over my head. Like there are statements he's made about various tribes and cultures. No, no, no look, he he says some pretty racist stuff. I think it just kind of went over my head at the time because I feel like he's talking about like. Like, for example, he said something about a particular tribe in Africa, uh, and, and I won't repeat what he said, but in my mind, I'm thinking, well, he's not talking about all black people. He's just talking about that one tribe in Africa. Maybe it's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it had to make sense in your mind, because this guy, presumably at this point in your teenage years, what, was he like a deity to you? You know, it's weird, because I, I never looked up to him that way. I almost, I, there was almost a time, uh, one time, in, uh, I can remember one specific time when I was studying at Flag, that I almost had to ask myself, what would I say if somebody asked me why we cared so much about what this one guy had to say? And I felt really anxious because I was like, oh shit, I wouldn't know how to answer that question. I was like, damn, I need an answer. But I remember at the time not being so much concerned that I didn't have the answer, being more concerned that I needed to be able to give someone the answer. I wasn't concerned. It, like this is sort of some cognitive dissonance going on. It didn't personally trouble me that I was like, oh no, why do we care? I, I was troubled by the fact of like, oh, shoot, if somebody asks me this question, I won't be able to give them an answer and I need to give them something. And this is around the time that I learned that L. Ron Hubbard had claimed he was the reincarnation of Buddha or to be more specific, he was the Maitreya. Um, and he wrote a book called The Hymn of Asia about how he was Buddha and was reincarnating to finish the work he had started as Buddha. And he had to finish that work by creating Scientology. And I was like, that's a great answer. Everybody loves Buddha. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. So, so I didn't look up to L. Ron Hubbard as a deity. It's one of these things where it's just as a child, I was set down this path. And on this path, we studied what L. Ron Hubbard wrote. And all the adults in my life seemed to think he was the one that had all the right answers. And that's where we you're supposed to go for the answers. So that's what we did. But there was no worship of L. Ron Hubbard. Um, there was nothing in Scientology that said he was a supreme being or a prophet or Scientologists don't even believe in God. In fact, Scientology says that we are essentially all God and that L. Ron Hubbard had made these breakthroughs so that we could all reachieve, uh, re regain the godlike potential we used to have trillions of years ago and he figured it out and he created Scientology so that we could all figure it out as well and be like L. Ron Hubbard. We were all trying to be like L. Ron Hubbard. That's probably different than what most people would say about God, right? Where a Christian wouldn't say they're trying to become God, right? They wouldn't. No. Right. Scientologists would say, we are all trying to become, to get back to our godlike status. So that's how I thought of L. Ron Hubbard. But I also thought that we were just on the path to try to be like him. And the fact that he had an opinion on everything from how to, you know, how to feed babies to how to clean windows was just, I never just really gave that stuff much thought. I didn't particularly care. And then, well, yeah, because also you and your teens and stuff, right? There's other things distracting you, presumably. But then I'm also trying to imagine, so where are you? Like, where are you sleeping each night? Are you in a house? Or, and, then, and then do you just go to the cinema with a couple of friends? Do you just go out on a date with a girl and stuff like that? I don't mean to obsess about that. I'm just thinking of typical teenage stuff. Yeah, no, dating was strictly forbidden. At, in clear in Clearwater at this time in, in the program that I was doing at the time that I was doing it even flirting would get you kicked out potentially yeah um so we're living in apartments uh real apartments you know real apartments that a normal person with a real job might rent except except so so I'm thinking in my case it was a three bedroom apartment with a kitchen except in each bedroom is two two sets of bunk beds so you've got like four people in a room plus two bunk beds in the living room. So you've got like two, four, six, eight, ten, sixteen 16 people in a three bedroom apartment that has two bathrooms and you're only there to sleep and shower. You don't, there's no, hang, you're not, you're not hanging out. So you're still, remember you're studying from nine o'clock in the morning to 10 o'clock at night. 
except nine o'clock in the morning is when course starts. So you still got to wake up, shower, exercise, eat breakfast, you know, take a bus to the base. So you're, you're waking up at seven, you're going to bed at midnight on, on a good day. And that's seven days a week. But you like, but but you enjoyed this stage, or were you already starting to be like, oh, actually, no. I enjoyed that stage because right, I'm thinking this is where he's going to talk about. Because you said before you got hang-ups from stuff that happened later in Scientology, and so I'm thinking, well, this must be it. No, that's not it. That's not it. And by the way, one of the things that made it enjoyable is um, the particular program that I was doing. There was a thousand, about a thousand other staff members from Scientology orgs all over the world, and about at least a hundred, maybe 150 of those were my age. So, and we're talking all over the world. So, you know, I've got dear friends that, you, you know, it's almost like when people go through battle together, you know, you, it forges a certain kind of relationship. And, you know, look, studying Scientology courses doesn't really compare to battle. But the culture and the pressure and the stresses that get artificially created on you. Like really Scientologists think that what they're doing is that the fate of the world rests on their shoulders and the fate of the world depends on what you do here and now in Scientology. And, and that was, you know, that was pounded into us, um, as L. Ron Hubbard say, with an atomic branding iron. And, and I took that seriously, that I did take seriously. And, um, the, uh, the fact that, what was being instilled in me was that there was a tremendous value, a tremendous importance in what we were doing. And I really excelled on that training program in particular. Um, I was one, again, at that young age, I ended up being one of the leaders of that training program. I was the first one to officially finish it. I helped get it. Like I was very much looked up to by my peers at that time. And my peers included people who were, adults, doctors, lawyers, you know, professionals, like I ended up with a very uh, strong self image, if you will, because, well, I excelled in that program, what can I say? And, and so when I say it was a good experience, it was only a good experience for me. There's plenty of people on that training program who had horrible experiences, it just wasn't mine. And um, so by the time I finished that program, I was, oh, but you said uh, your original question was like, what was your day like? Were you going out to the movies? So I probably, for the last 12 months of that program, didn't have a single day off, not one. That, I mean, movies are considered other fish to fry. Now you could ask for, you could every now and then get a day off. And if you had a day off, you're allowed to go to the movies. Um, but the particular program that I was doing, there was so much stress as being put on that program that asking for a day off was just un unheard of, even if you were eligible to ask. Um, so yeah, no, but movies weren't completely unheard of. If you, know, if you got three or four days off a year, you could go to the movies on that day off. Sometimes as a reward, if production had been really high, they would actually play a movie on 35 millimeter in the auditorium as, as like an award, you know? When did you first, how old were you when you first dated and were with a woman let's say 18 okay it's not that late no there there are many aspects of my child uh, my upbringing that 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 i do go i a little bit thank god i didn't go to high school i sort of got to bypass that awkward stage and that's a stage where a lot of people that i grew up with got into a lot of trouble legal trouble drugs you know um some of them are dead. So, I mean, it's not like I grew up in a rough neighborhood, but even in a relatively middle-class neighborhood that I grew up with, a lot of those guys are in a lot of trouble. A lot of those guys aren't around anymore. Um, and I sort of wonder, you know, I didn't have a, a great structure, a great stable household. I was like, I could have easily gone that way if I'd been in high school. So in some ways, my experience at Flag gave me kind of the structure that perhaps um, I needed to bypass a lot of the potential pitfalls I could have gotten into if I had gone to high school. You know what I mean? 
you never really know, but that is how I feel about it. I feel the same way. I went to like an all boys school and people are always saying, oh, how did you, what, you're a teenager. What about all the, you didn't see all the girls and stuff. And I just think, thank God for that because I would have been so distracted. I'd have been so worried about how I look every day. I, I wouldn't have been doing the classes and stuff. Are you kidding me? I'd be like socializing and trying to do all that and trying to get everyone's attention. So I look back relieved. But then I suppose it's that thing of you only know one thing and you always, most people, you know, people who did go to those mixed schools and things and were able to date at that age probably also a lot of them are also happy but yeah i see what you're saying so so what then happens what where's the bit where's the bad what what goes on next when i talk about the bad personality traits or whatever i'm talking about being very sort of harsh and uh quick temper and always expecting something has to be done to be done right away i mean things that some people would go what's wrong with that and i okay in moderation i have a hard time just yeah. being chill <laughs> yeah of course <laughs> And so I'm like, oh, what's the big deal? That's just, you know, masculinity or whatever. I, I don't know. All I'm saying is sometimes it's a problem. All I'm saying is sometimes I go, I wish I just wasn't in a bad mood all the time. I wish I wasn't so demanding all the time. I wish I wasn't so quick to anger sometimes. You know, like it, it's something I'm aware in myself that I go, I, I end up treating I end up treating, uh, you know, things in life constantly like I would have treated them from being on staff and being in the Sea Org, where, where, where it does, where it did become, People are a cog in a machine. People are not just people. Um, you have to sort of set their peopledom to the side, their personhood to the side, their humanity to the side. We're not here to deal with your humanity. We're here to get the job done. And I was very good at doing that and approaching things that way and getting other people to approach things that way. I excelled in that department. Um, and I, I do feel that is a function of pretty much being put on a path, having a job put in front of you, being told how to do it, and excelling at that. And it's hard to step away from that, you know? It becomes so innate, you can't just change your personality, you know? Why did you step away from it? Oh, no, I mean step away from, um, step away from um, thinking a certain way. I don't mean can't step away from Scientology, but is that what you mean? Why did I step away from Scientology? Yeah, what, what, what eventually, like, where did it go from there that led to, because it sounds... Like it sounds awful, but it sounds like you were having a great time. So <laughs> where did it sort of go wrong to the point that you wanted to leave? So, well, I'll give you the fast forward version uh, of that. So I, at 15 years old, I finished up in Clearwater and I'm still thinking, this is awesome. I want to do this for the rest of my life. And then I go back to Philadelphia and, and the people that were running the Philadelphia org were such horrible, horrible people. I'm looking at you, Bonnie DiMartino, Attilio DiMartino, Edward DiMartino, Samantha Valeric to a lesser extent. I'm looking at you assholes, okay? Which is ironic because my mom married a DiMartino that has nothing to do with those DiMartinos and my younger brother's name is DiMartino. <laughs> That's funny. So, and Michael DiMartino and Edward DiMartino, you guys are horrible people and I, I wish you nothing but the worst, okay? So yeah. those well, guys okay. made those guys made my experience working at the Philadelphia Org so horrible that after being there for only three years, I actually left Scientology for two years and moved to LA with my brother and just sort of effed off for two years. Then I real, but, but in my mind, I hadn't actually left Scientology. I was just no longer going to do it for a while. But remember, if you break your contract of volunteerism or whatever, you owe them money for everything that you did. So at 17 years old, um, at 17 years old, I left staff and I owed Scientology $100,000. <laughs> oh, that's insane. I say 17. I was just about to turn 18. And so for two years, in my mind, I was a Scientologist but didn't do any Scientology from 1998 to 2000. And then I went back to Philadelphia to finish my contract because I was never going to be able to come up with $100,000. Okay. So, I'll, okay, for short version. I go back to Philadelphia for two years. I finish my contract. And then after that, I joined the Sea Org. Okay. But remember, I'd already had a horrible experience in Philadelphia, right? And at this point, I really didn't want to keep working for Scientology, but I could never get out of my head how much I enjoyed being in Clearwater. So when the opportunity was presented to me to join the Sea Org, I was like, you know what? I do remember how much I wanted to do that so badly. And I've sort of fallen away from that now. But now that the opportunity is being put in front of me, I should just do it, even if I don't want to. I should just do it because I do remember how badly I wanted to do it before. So I'm going to take this opportunity. And so I joined the Sea Org, but I didn't go to Clearwater. I went to Los Angeles. 
And the short version here is that my experience being in the Sea Org in Los Angeles was again so effing horrible that I was like, I don't want to do this anymore. So after four years of that, my wife and I sort of accidentally got pregnant. <laughs> ah, <laughs> so you that's can't not allowed. Have you can't have children in the Sea Org. So if you have children in the Sea Org, if you get pregnant, you either have to go to the clinic and get it taken care of, or you have to leave the Sea Org. Well, the only reason we got pregnant was so that we could get the golden parachute out of the Sea Org. Not that they give you any money, but. <laughs> sure. So what were, what were some of the sort of worst things, just to give us an idea, that, was, that were going on in the Sea Org day to day? I, I mean, the worst things is you wake up at seven o'clock in the morning after having four hours of sleep and you have to go to a morning meeting and your commanding officer is trying to punch you in the head at the meeting. Actually punch you in the head. Trying to. He never succeeded, but. <laughs> you, just, you just ducked and dived. I'm a pretty sly little individual. <laughs> Bloody hell. Because Mike Rinder talks about, again, I mean, there were times where it sounds like, it sounds like Mike Rinder was both extremely aggressive to people below him but also very submissive to say uh, david miscavige the leader so he talks in his he writes in his book about just getting punched in the face by david who's half his height uh and just having to take it and david would david miscavige would just hit him beat him up do whatever to him, throw him in the hole for days at a time was that like did any of that happen to you or was that like select for people like mike the stories that mike tells because they involve david miscavige and the international base are to a certain degree somewhat unique to the international base things were actually much worse up there than they were down in la which is something i thought was the opposite because remember from my experience in clearwater i thought clearwater was so great because david miscavige had his hand in that pie to a greater extent than he did anywhere else. I thought the closer you got to Miscavige, the better things were. So when I was in Philly and it was horrible, I'm like, well, that's because we're so far away from the, the positive influence of David Miscavige. When I even was in LA and it was shitty, I was like, that's because we're still further away from the influence of David Miscavige than we were in Clearwater. It wasn't until 2009 that I found out the closer you get to Miscavige, the worse it gets. And that's why stories from like Mark Headley and Mike Rinder and Jeff Hawkins and, 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 and et cetera are so horrible because they worked closer with Miscavige than anybody. So in LA, things were pretty bad, but not quite as bad as in management. But I didn't know that. I didn't know that at the time. So, I mean, things like, um, I'll give you an example. In management, they would throw people into a dirty pond and call it overboarding, you know, as a punishment. Well, in LA, they would just pour a five-gallon bucket of water over your head and call that overboarding. Like they would do that to grown women who were professional Scientology auditors for not making enough hours. You know, um, I mean, and I'll give you other let's just examples that to some people might just sound silly. Like as Sea Org members, we weren't. There's certain, you know, my, my job that I had was overseeing the course rooms and overseeing where the professional auditing was delivered. Well, the course rooms would have a 15 minute break from like 3.30 to 3.45. Well, the public were allowed to take a break, but we were not allowed to take a break. To We weren't allowed to go get a little snack or something like that. Well, I was like, you know, screw that. I'm going to my room. I'm going to get a snack. I got some sausage. I got, you know, I got some summer sausage in my little refrigerator. I'm going to get a snack. Well, I would, there was one incident where I literally got into a physical altercation with another Sea Org member because his job was to prevent other Sea Org members from going to get anything <laughs> to eat at 3.30. I mean, this gets, it sounds so silly and stupid. It's like his job was to make sure nobody went to go get food at break time. That was his job, to stand at the door and to physically prevent people from getting anything to eat at 3.30. Were you ever the, were you ever the one who had to, were you disciplining others in any ways? I, uh, I would discipline my juniors only to the extent of yelling. You know, I would never, I never discipline people with physical, uh, physical with touch. But, you know, okay. you know, that, that Did you feel thing. angry? Oh my God. Yes, I could scream. I could rip someone's face off verbally. Yes. I was good at that. Yeah. You are a bit scary, Aaron. Sometimes, uh, you know, it depends on the day. Well, sorry, I'm, I'm thinking, oh, he's in one. Of, no, not really. You, you, don't you, don't well, tell anybody. What, don't tell anybody about that uh, that incident. <laughs> that incident when you, you smashed through the the screen. No, but obviously, I can see that you weren't you weren't violent. But yeah, that real anger. You, you really felt that anger. Yeah. You, you but know. you know, it's funny because one of the things Scientology tries to do to discredit me is they say that I was a violent person in the Sea Org who beat people up. It just that never occurred. So I'll give you just one example. I had a senior who was a woman, and we were actually good friends. Um, 
but she would get a lot of heat from her boss for being too soft on me. So I remember one incident, she came and got in my face about something she thought I was doing wrong. But it's hard to take her very seriously because we're close friends. And here she is like screaming at me. And I, I wasn't being as deferential to her as she wanted me to be in the conversation. So she grabbed my tie and yanked it and pulled me by my tie. And in response, I pushed her away. I pushed her off of me. This gets spun into like I beat up a woman. I'm just giving you an example. Like this is an interaction that would be, it's not like when I say typical, untypical, it's not like that would happen every day, but a Sea Org member would hear that story and go, that's not unusual in the Sea Org. That's not unusual, even if it doesn't happen every day. Okay. So she yanked my tie and I pushed her off of me. That was the end of the interaction. It's not like she then jumped on top of me or I jumped on top of her or someone got in a, a kick at the end. No, she yanked my tie. I pushed her off of me. End of story. And that gets spun into like, I beat up a woman. Hmm. <laughs> so, Is this part of the fair game tactics that after you left? Oh, sure. Yeah. I mean, they'll say anything about you. They, they don't care. But I'm, I'm using that as an example of one, that's not unusual for Sea Org members to treat each other that way. I mean, could you imagine going into the office and y your, your seniors laying hands on you? You know, I had one time um, the commanding officer came into my office and demanded that I stop doing what I'm doing and get up and go do something else. And I just, again, wasn't as deferent as he wanted me to be in that moment. And he swung at my head. And he slowly glanced off the top of my head and I grabbed him and I just held on to him really tightly so that he couldn't hit me, honestly. Um, but I never hit him. I never hit him back. I mean, I went striking your senior would be considered somewhat un unheard of. Like, that's what you don't do. And, and that's reflected in the stories that you hear from Mike Rinder about Miscavige beating people up. Nobody ever tried to hit Miscavige back. Except Mark Headley once almost sort of did and like three people grabbed him, you know. So like physical violence is just not unheard of or even very frowned upon in the Sea Org. So I'll add on to that the fact that Scientology's management system is such that someone has to be to blame for anything that happens. Like if stats are down on Christmas, you know, stats are down everywhere on Christmas except for Toys R Us and Amazon, you know, <laughs> YouTube. YouTube stats are down on Christmas. Someone has to be to blame for the reason why stats went down on Christmas. I'm just using this as an, a very real example. The fact that the culture in the Sea Org was that someone, there always had to be a head to put on a pike for anything, combined with the fact that temper and exhibiting temper is considered a, a, a positive characteristic of, of an executive in Scientology, it just made the Sea Org experience just horrible. Everybody was always at war. And, and you can you can be the next guy to be singled out as the reason for, for something. For for no other reason than the fact that somebody has to be singled out. And it just gets it just gets exhausting after after years. Speaking of singled out as a segue here, how did you meet your wife um no, no longer being single? So you were you were both on the Sea Org together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we just were, we just were essentially working. We weren't even in the same organization, but our job duties overlapped. So she was in a senior organization, but her job required her to essentially, um, you could say, have some oversight of what was happening in my organization. So we just sort of met that way. And even that had to be a brokered arrangement. Like I never would have asked her out because she was in a senior organization. It's somewhat unheard of. So like one of her coworkers like sort of came to me and was like, oh, I hear you might be interested in, you know, Heather. And I, and I was afraid she was calling me out. I was like, oh, what? I, did, I didn't say that to anybody. <laughs> and then she was like, well, if you were, she might, also be interested in that i was like okay thanks for the heads up now in heather's my wife's mind not now my wife's mind in her mind she thought that meant i was going to go ask her out it did not it did not mean that at all <laughs> i was just relieved i wasn't in trouble <laughs> <laughs> were you attracted to her though were you flattered oh no i i had told other people that like oh if i could go out with anybody it would be her <laughs> oh wow well that's but cool I, I didn't expect anything to come of it <laughs> 
<laughs> it's a really funny story. And so every time she would run into me, she was like expecting that I was going to stop and try to talk to her and ask her out. I was completely shy. I am in general shy when it comes to that kind of stuff. And um, that was never going to happen in a million years. <laughs> so eventually, um, eventually she called me up on our little walkie talkies that certain Sea members had. And, and I was just working late in my office or whatever. And she was like, I'm, I'm tired of waiting. And I'm like, I'm still thinking, what in the world is she talking about? <laughs> 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 and eventually I'm like, Oh, and, and she's senior to me. I had to call her, sir. You know, Scientology in theory, you call women, sir. <laughs> my God. <laughs> Yeah. So every so time you, I see so you go, like, yes, oh, sir. Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Absolutely, sir, sir, sir. Yeah, women are called Mister in the Sea Org. It's uh, officers are called Mister. Like like Mark, Mark and Claire Headley. Um, when you if you ever see a Scientology document and it refers to Mister Headley, it's not talking about Mark. It's talking about Claire. <laughs> wow, that's fascinating. So anyway, she's like, I'm tired of waiting, and I'm like, waiting for what? <laughs> and she goes, What do you think? And I was like waiting for me <laughs> <laughs> and that's low really self-esteem and it was really it sounds like low self-esteem but it was really just just yeah. naivete really um and she was so it's hard to describe how senior to me that she was like it's not just like she was my boss she would have been like my boss's 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 boss so it was never going to happen unless unless she pushed the push the point and she did push the point and now going out in the sea org means like walking around the block at night there's no going out there's no dating in the sea org so um anyway i mean i think we were pretty much decided to get married after like three weeks or something like that and that was like almost wow. 20 years ago <laughs> it's worked well then hasn't it yeah <laughs> my god so when did you do you remember the conversation because did you have to sort of uh nudge each other to, or find out try and find out if you both wanted to leave so we never had a specific conversation about it and that kind of sort of speaks to the insanity of the thought control and behavior control that exists in the c organization l ron hubbard wrote a policy that it is a high crime to even discuss with another person the fact that you're thinking of leaving and that and that applies to married couples. So it was becoming very apparent to her that I was, you know, really not wanting to be there anymore. I was getting into some trouble. Um, I would, you know, it was very apparent that I was not wanting to be there anymore. And there was just one interaction where I did say to her, the only reason I'm not leaving is because I don't want to get a divorce. And that's, that's all. I said, the only reason I'm not leaving is because I don't want to get a divorce. And she was like, well, just know that if you leave, I will leave too. Oh, that must've been nice to hear. Yeah. And so, you know, it's not even that we didn't even beyond that, like what I just expressed to you is the absolute extent of any conversation we ever had about it. We didn't even have a conversation of like, Hey, why don't we get pregnant? No, it was sort of a, uh, obviously certain things are required in order to get pregnant. So, you know, there was cooperation required on both sides, but without a conversation, I mean, just how crazy does this sound? We never even uh, had a conversation where it's like, hey, how about we have a baby and start a family and we can get out of here? Never even had that conversation. However, when she did take a pregnancy test and tested positive, we were both like, oh, we had a little celebration. We got some sushi. We got some cheese. We got some Diet Coke. We had a little sushi meal in our, in our room. Like We were both like, okay this is how we're going to get out of here. this is how we're going to get out of here because getting out is a long humiliating process and it's hard to do that if all you're doing is saying i don't want to be here anymore what would happen oh you get separated and you get put under watch and you get uh manual labor and you get sec checked until but what if you, you what if you say thanks for this thanks for the sec check the checks and all the different things i'm literally walking out that door now bye bye Oh, well, if you've already gone through all the sec checks, then you're fine. You can, you can leave. But what if you, I don't want to, because what is a sec checks? Just, they're basically just giving you sort of a therapy kind of thing and trying to convince you to stay. No, a sec check would be like dozens to hundreds of hours of interrogation on the email. Oh, fucking hell. Now, it's so insane. If, you, if you want to leave the Sea Org and you want to continue to be a Scientologist in good standing, you have to go through that process. So if you say, go F yourself, I'm walking out the door right now, they might put up a fight for a little bit, but eventually they'll let you go, but they'll expel you from Scientology. I forgot. See, that's the thing that's hard for people who aren't in it to understand 
is that it was still important and it, for anyone who wants to leave the Sea Org, there's still that sort of, uh, it would, I don't want to use the word brainwashing because I, I don't think it's a real thing necessarily, but there's still that wanting to be part of it. That's right. So even when we got to the point where we were like, man, this is pure hell. We don't want to do this anymore. There was still actually no part of us that thought, and we want to leave Scientology. No, we were like, no, the Sea Org, is, these guys are all screwed up and this is not good. We, we still wanted to do Scientology. We still wanted to be in Scientology. My whole family was Scientologists. Her whole family was Scientologists. All we wanted to do was leave the Sea Org. But this is how Scientology also has control over second generation members like this. If you don't agree to go through their procedures for leaving the Sea Org, you're going to be expelled and you're not going to see your, your family's going to disconnect from you. So, so that's why getting pregnant is the easiest and fastest way out of the Sea Org because they can't subject you to months and months of BS because now they don't want someone walking around looking pregnant, right? They don't want that. Do you call your first child something like hope or escape or something? <laughs> Freedom. No, she actually has a somewhat funny name. <laughs> you, I guess yeah. I probably shouldn't say it. But um, I guess not. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. And all my daughters' names begin with B. Well, totally not, not intentional, not for any reason. But they all—they all have the same initials. <laughs> we didn't BS. think that one through. We didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh. BSL. BSL. Um, yeah. So yeah, we, we didn't think that one through. But um, okay. but BSL doesn't mean anything, does it? Does it? It's just BS does. BS does. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. So, but that's the short story of how did you go from thinking this was all great to wanting to leave? The sh that was that was the short story of how we got to wanting to leave the Sea Org, and then it wasn't until two thousand. That was, by the way, we left the Sea Org in two thousand six, and then in two thousand nine is when people like Mike Rinder, and at that time Marty Rathbun and Mark Headley, and Tom DeVocht, and uh, Jeff Hawkins, and Jenna Miscavige started coming out. And I knew these people, um, at least as sort of celebrities in Scientology. And they started telling stories that made it clear like, oh, it's even worse at international management. One of the ways I excused all of the abuse and horrible behavior that I saw is I thought it got worse the further away you got from management. It got worse the closer you got to management. And that made me start to reevaluate everything, um, at least at a surface level. And then when I found out from the same people that the, um, the upper advanced OT levels that Scientologists believe L. Ron Hubbard finished before he died, these are the secret levels that Miscavige has always said, L. Ron Hubbard finished these, they're, they're in the vault, they're completely ready for release. This is why Scientologists stick around and put up with so much abuse is because they think the real magic is being held waiting to be released when Scientology reaches certain expansion benchmarks. And when I found out that that itself is a lie, that there, L. Ron Hubbard did not leave behind any OT levels, he did not leave behind anything the magic doesn't exist. This whole thing that Scientologists believe, full operating Thetan, full OT, OT9 and 10, OT15, it's a lie. That's when I was like, oh, I'm done. Bye. You no longer have any power over me whatsoever. Um, that, started, that started in 2009. Um, but, but you also see how me wanting to leave the Sea Org was a completely different conversation than me wanting to leave Scientology or not believing in Scientology anymore. Which is fascinating. And then what, where, where was your brother, where was your mom at this point? So, well, for my brother, we'll back up. So on the training program that I said I was doing in Clearwater, he was on that program with me. And remember, we were only 15 years old when that program finished. At the tail end of that program, my brother got into a lot of trouble there at the base um, for stupid shit, you know, like, like fucking going to the movies without permission or getting a, a you know, getting a, a titty mag or something. Um, but things that in Scientology at that time were honestly considered unforgivable, which just sounds so, so stupid when I say it now. But anyway, he was sent home. But remember, my mom was at Clearwater, okay? And the only person that was in Philadelphia was the guy she had been married to but had gotten divorced from since she went to Clearwater, okay? 
So he was sent back to Philly at the age of 15 to live with a guy he wasn't related to uh, who was charging him rent, a 15-year-old. And my brother was supposed to be working at the Philadelphia org. And eventually he's like, screw this. And he you know, stopped going to the org and whatnot. Anyway, so my brother sort of, as far as Scientology was concerned, you know, sort of fell, fell off the wagon. Okay. And then I said that in 1998, me and my brother moved to California together. So during that time, he really got kind of involved in like uh, drinking and drugs. Um, when I went back to Philadelphia to finish my staff contract, he did not. He stayed in LA, continued to get more into drinking and drugs, got into some legal trouble, ended up moving with my dad, moving in with my dad and his wife in New Mexico, um, started uh, going to school, um, was doing really well, was still into drinking and drugs though. And he ended up dying in a car accident. Uh, he was not the driver, but the driver was drunk. And everyone was drunk in the car, but my brother was not the driver. And he died in that car accident in 2003. So I was still in the Sea Org in Los Angeles. In fact, I had just recently joined the Sea Org when he died. So by the time, and my, my mom, um, uh, when I left Clearwater, at the age of 15, that was the last time I was like supported by my mom. Like I was basically on my own from 15 on. So when my mom finished her training and came back to Philadelphia, it was her who was living with me, not the other way around. Um, so I'm trying to give you, I'm giving you multiple answers to one question. So when I left the Sea Org, my mom was still working for Scientology in Philadelphia. In 2009, when I started leaving Scientology, my mom had already finished her staff contract in Philadelphia and was also now living in Clearwater and was also on her own path out of Scientology. She was waking, she was waking up to the same things I was waking up to. I'm so sorry to hear about your brother. That must have been really quite tragic to hear. How did it feel hearing about that? Oh, it was the worst thing. Yeah, it was not good. It was not good. I told that story on the Scientology in the Aftermath show. And uh, yeah, no, it was the worst thing you could imagine. So you, you weren't affected at that point by that feeling of like, oh, it's just a thetan in a body or anything? Oh, no. I, I never, I mean, yeah, no. No, that, that didn't bring any comfort. Yeah. I tended not to think about things that way, you know? Because it's one of those things where like, again, as I've said, you, you sort of put on a path, you're given a job to do. The things I did in Scientology were more so that it's what I knew and it's what I was really, really good at. It's not necessarily that I was motivated by some really deep overriding belief. The belief is just kind of what sprang up every now and then when I had to convince myself why I was going to keep doing this thing I didn't really want to be doing anymore. Feels like being in the army. Maybe. I mean, I was never in the army, but give me an example of how that worked. Well, just because I think a lot of people who are soldiers in the army don't necessarily believe in the wars that they're fighting. Some do, of course, but I think a lot of them don't. It's just more about some of them enjoy that lifestyle. Some of them like the discipline. Some of them don't know what else to do and they're just sort of there. I'm only talking about a generalization, of course. I don't speak for all people in the army, but uh, that's how I lot of it isn't it reminds me a little bit of how you've described your time in Scientology that does make sense because even the story that I would tell myself of like oh remember why we're doing this it's not like you could draw a direct line between what I was doing and the story that I was telling myself it's just something I told myself to make continuing to do what I was doing more palatable you know, it's not like I woke up every day and did my job in the Sea Org and I'm like, yep, we're, we're getting rid of the prison planet. <laughs> it's like, you're not, you're obviously nothing you're doing today has anything to do with the prison planet, but somehow that story is, remember why this is so important. Remember why you're doing this. Oh yes, yes, yes. Now I remember. Okay. Back to the fields. <laughs> Hey, how are you? How are you doing now? How how do you raise your children? Do you think it's affected by your own childhood in Scientology? Um, I think so, but I can tell you that um, my kids. It's weird, like because my wife and I, we were still, you know, we didn't officially leave Scientology until 2014. We had our first kid in 2006, so that's eight years, eight years, and our kids are all two years apart. So. 
We had a kid in 2006, 2008, 2010. Yeah. So we had all three of our kids. We, for four years, all of them had all of them for four years before we left Scientology. We never said one word to our kids about Scientology. It's almost this weird thing. It's almost like, imagine what that means for us. Like my wife and I never had a conversation where we said, we are not going to use Scientology on our kids. We are not going to introduce our kids to Scientology. It's almost like, it was almost like it, at our DNA level, we were like, look, this might've been fine for us. We sort of made it through okay. We're not doing this with our kids. And we didn't even have a conversation about that. And yet that's what we did. We never did Scientology with our kids. They didn't never heard the word L. Ron Hubbard. They didn't see Scientology books. They didn't, you know, do study how to use a dictionary, how to, you know, this, how to that. And so I'm answering the question in sort of two different ways. Um, Scientology did not affect our kids' upbringing, other than perhaps the damage Scientology has done to either me and or my wife and how that might be passed on to our kids. Um, probably more on my end than my wife's end. Um, but like, yeah, they, they never were exposed to any of that. And I find that also to be pretty common and pretty true for second generation members who are like, you know, I did okay with it, but not my kids. I'm not doing that with my kids. Is there any other religion that you take them to a thing for? Oh, no. I, I, I'm pretty atheisty. Hmm. <laughs> well, fair enough. Me too. Me too. Yeah. Oh, well, and, 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 and that's it. You're, and you're doing quite beautifully now, right? Right, Aaron? Right? <laughs> oh, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Um, no, it's funny, like, because I didn't have that high school experience or whatever, I'm, I'm very open about that with my kids, you know? Yeah. Uh, they, they, they think it's funny because they can How tease they? me about it. 16, 14, and 12. Okay. <laughs> oh, they must be giving you shit about, like, school. Oh, you didn't learn about an Oxbow Lake, Dad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my oldest, she's 16, but they also started school a bit early. So she's already a junior in high school. And so she'll be like, you wouldn't know anything about this, Dad. You didn't go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's hilarious. I love it. And, um, <laughs> but I also, you know, I'll try to explain to them all the time my thought process. Like, and I don't know if this is something because of Scientology or if it's part of how I unwind from Scientology. I'll be like, look, if I'm asking you to, I'm not asking you to do this because like, uh, I, I'll frame everything. I'll be like, what I want, I want you guys to understand how I think and how I think so that if I tell you something, it's not, I'm not just giving you an order that you have to blindly follow. Like I want you guys to be able to ask me, why is it that you want me to do it that way? Or do I have to do it now? Like I, I'm also in some ways trying to treat them, not like just kids. I guess that's one thing I've taken from Scientology. I know how much it resonated with me to not just be treated like a kid. And so I try to do that to them in a positive way and not a negative way. Like I want them to be able to have the kid experience, but I also want them to know that I'm willing for them to have, you know, freedoms and privileges. And it, they're not just kids because I know how good that felt to be grant, granted. Um, the Scientology board would be granted beingness, granted more beingness, that you're not just a kid. You're capable of being treated as a relative equal. So my way of treating them as an equal is to explain to them the reasons for things or how I'm thinking about something or why this might be the better way to do it um, so that they're, uh, they're not just expected to, you only have to do what mom and dad says and that's the end of it. You know what I mean? So I try to be aware of the negative aspects of Scientology and not, and not to keep that from flowing through. But you know, everyone's got their blind spots and it's hard to, it's hard to know what to do about that. What is your aim with your channel growing up in Scientology? Do you, do you want to bring down oh, and expose? I want to be David Miscavige's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> and that can take on different forms because the truth is Scientology's worst nightmare is just having the truth of their abuses exposed. So I make that a priority. I also just enjoy trolling the shit out of them. Um, I enjoy the fact that there's nothing, the internet age has advanced to a point where there's just literally nothing Scientology can do about the people who expose their abuses and their lies and their fraud. And, and, and it has become a fraud. Like it's not just a belief system. Like Christianity, you want to believe in Jesus, you want to believe in God, maybe it's true, maybe it's not. But it's not like they're hiding some secret document in the vault that says it's not true and they're keeping it from you. 
it's faith. Scientology is literally a fraud. They're literally telling people, L. Ron Hubbard accomplished X, Y, and Z. The proof of it is right behind this locked door here. And once you give me enough money, you'll get the secrets. That is demonstrably and provably false. So on the one hand, I want to help Scientologists wake up to this fact and stop throwing their time and their money away on what is literally a scam and a fraud. And I try to do that in as honest of a way as I can so that everything I say will resonate with a Scientologist and won't just sound like uh, hateful lies. Um, and and I, 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 you could almost characterize everything I do as just um, being David Miscavige's worst nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you want to help Aaron be David Miscavige, the leader of Scientology's worst nightmare, go check out Growing Up in Scientology, a wonderful YouTube channel. Go subscribe to that and find Aaron Smith-Levin on, on Twitter. You're on Twitter, aren't you? Maybe? I am uh, at Growing Up in SCN. There you go. That's short for Scientology, SCN. Thank you for being on The Edge, Aaron. Thanks for having me on. Join me on The Edge for new episodes every week. Start watching right now.